very high level of basic um, research required to create these drugs but I think the testing and quality control procedures that are that the uh, foreign companies are allegedly adhering to with their long um, trials and and so forth is something that makes a big difference on consumers preferences to use local domestically produced drugs versus internationally produced drugs this sort of assurance that they're probably safer they're more uh, you know, stringently tested and so on and so forth. So I think that's something peculiar about pharma that you wouldn't find in, in, in other, many other industries. So I, I guess we could uh, write a general report, but add in caveats when we feel that uh, right. some of these findings might be very right. uh, peculiar uh, or more suited to the pharmaceutical type industries. So, but, you know, sort of keep it general such that it doesn't narrow the uh, reach of the is that, is that how, how, how specialized is your own research just on pharma and how much have you been? So the, some uh, of the exams you gave were not pharma. No, so the multinational side is passed across sectors. Spain, right. uh, yeah. And uh, the domestic uh, industry, again, this is IMS funded, which happened to be in the pharmaceutical industry. So, uh, and my wife uh, is uh, is uh, went to Stanford and did molecular biology, so there's a lot of spillovers uh, in the household as well. So, dinner conversations are not done. All right, thank you. So my work is yeah, thank you, Anand. Great job. Um, we so although we we only met once and spoke on the phone one or two times. I think we achieved some sort of uh, coordination and one of those uh, things that we agreed on as, as Anand has already done is um, um, highlight the background and the path dependencies upon the intellectual property regimes in, in both countries. So I won't go into that. What I'll talk about is, uh, and I won't spend as much time as Anand, I mean, my, my um, topic is very focused. This is done with a co-author in mainland China. Um, I, haven't, I haven't put his name here, but um, he was responsible for much of the work, which was also funded by IEMS. And here we're looking at determinants of uh, quadic patenting, market access, imitative threat, competition, and strength of an intellectual property rights. So it touches upon many of the themes that Anand has already spoken about. But just to give you a background, um, triadic patents uh, are usually taken up by multinational companies, and they are patents that are registered in three different countries to protect the same invention. And triadic patent families are a set of patents filed in US, Japan, and the European Patent Office. So in this project, what we're looking at is the extent to which um, multinational take out patents in a fourth country, and why would they take out a patent in a fourth country? How would they, how would they come to a conclusion as to whether to take it out in India, in China, in Brazil, in Turkey, in addition to the three large sort of uh, uh, areas, the US, Japan, and, and uh, uh, Europe. So this, uh, over the last, uh, this, this project uh, looks at, uh, uses data from 1985 to 2004, and over this period, uh, there's been, and, and beyond, there's been a growing internationalization of innovation activities, and uh, particularly patenting activities. Uh, we see multinationals taking our patents. Uh, this idea of triadic patents has emerged since uh, the mid-1980s uh, in, in a big way, and I'll show you some simple graphs to, to indicate how uh, multinationals are taking out patents in, in these three countries much more uh, frequently. So there's an increasing focus on, on intellectual property rights as a, as a means for uh, protecting your IP in emerging markets such as China or India. So use of triadic patent family is, is often, is increasingly uh, being utilized as an indicator for innovativeness. This research focuses on quadic patents, uh, taking out of patents in four different places, and uh, the focus is on China. So here's a, a, a quick um, graph to show you the trends in triadic patents and the proportion of quadic patents from the period of 1985 to 2005. So in terms of triadic patents, there were about uh, less than 20,000 in 1985, and in two, by 2005, that figure had become threefold, 60,000. And um, the proportion of quadic patents to triadic patents varies by countries, 
Um, and for China, it is about 60%. So multinationals are taking out patents in the three large patenting offices, but also in many different fourth countries. Does that, just on that yep. chart, does that eliminate if they've taken on a fifth or a sixth? In other words, will you no. double count them? Yes, or yes. Okay, yes. okay. Yes. So yes. If, if, if I'm in the big three, if yes. you will, and I and do Australia, and I do China, you're, you're counting it. And yes. what it's saying is, once I'm in the big three, the preponderance is you're getting to, mark, you're getting to China first. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yep. So this project is basically an exploratory project trying to understand and, and see why, why that is the case. What, what are the factors that determine whether uh, uh, you go into China um, and what, what sort of considerations? You're getting the spike too. Right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. And um, in terms I'm just curious, triadic oh, yeah. what, what percentage of patents are triadic? That, I mean, are, lots of people, are most patents just done in one place or are most patents done in all three? No, for the multinationals who have operations in, in different markets, standard it's standard to do triadic patents, and, and that has been increasing. But now it's, it's gone from triadic to, to looking at the emerging markets over the last uh, you know, two or three decades to take out patents in a fourth country as well. Right, but this, uh, I guess my question, another question is, so presumably triadic patents are also going up? Yes. Over, so as yes. a proportion, is it becoming more... Is a higher percentage of all patents. As a percentage of patents. As a percentage of triadic patents. Well, let's put it this way. What percentage of triadic patents is all, are actually quite aquatic patents? What percentage of, of patents that are done in the big three countries also add forth at all? And is the percentage changing? Right. Those are that background I have in, a, in another paper will take me a couple of minutes to, 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 to pick out. But we'll, we'll keep that in mind. But anyway, the focus here is on, uh, on the reasons why that would be the case. Here's a proportion of inventors residing in the relevant country in total inventors in quadric patents. So the Koreans are the most uh, notable uh, indi company, Korean companies and individuals are the most notable group taking out patents in a fourth country. This is what this shows. Oh, this is based on where the country is. Yes. The country of origin. Yes. And here's a graph to show you about different industries. A proportion of quadric patents involving China to triadic patents in 19 different industries. And tobacco stands out, but in all industries, the percentage has been going up. The proportion of quadric patents involving China to triadic patents has been going up from 1985, from you know, roughly between 10 and 20% to 60% figure. Yes. So then we, we wanted to understand why, why this is the case. Uh, what are the factors that would uh, influence a company's uh, decision to take out a patent in a fourth country? So the first is market size and market access. Um, and there's literature to, to, to back this up. The size of a host country market, trade, multinational con uh, MNC operations in that market. Large domestic market represents large potential for exploiting technological know-how. Imports and foreign investments represent extent of realized potential. So the first hypothesis is market size, market access. The size of the market and the degree of foreign penetration in the local market have a positive influence on quadric pattern applications. The second and third hypotheses are imitative threat and competitive pressure. And this is the idea that the great, greater the technological capability of local firms, uh, that raises the imitative threat that they pose the greater competition triggers a need for introducing state-of-the-art technologies and protecting them, and greater competition triggers a need for patent portfolios for preventing defensive patenting by competitors in the local markets. However, there is little research on the role of domestic market competition on this phenomena. So the second hypothesis that we pose is the imitative threat. Imitative threat is in the local market has a positive influence on quadric patent applications. And the third closely related hypothesis is competitive pressure. Product market competition has a positive impact on quadric patent applications. And finally, the fourth one, as Jay mentioned and, and, and Anand also spoke to, is the strength of intellectual property regime. The patent decision depends on the extent of protection guaranteed from infringement. Weak enforcement would reduce incentive for patenting. However, there's a body of literature which says that beyond a certain level, IP protection may not matter much. 
So we hypothesize that the strength of the intellectual property regime has an inverted U-shaped effect on quadric pattern applications. So basically, these were the, these were the determinants that we were looking at. My co-author co uh, did much of the data analysis. We used two sets of data sources. Uh, for the China, we used data from 18 Chinese manufacturing industries from 1985 to 2004. For the international, we looked at 38 countries and regions that have at least aquatic patent from the period of 85 to 2004. The dependent variable was a number of aquatic patent applications. For the market size data, we, looked at, we took the uh, data from the China Statistical Yearbook, Annual Survey of Industrial Enterprises, World Banks, World Trade Production and Protection, uh, Manual, World Development Indicators, and so forth. Uh, yes? Can we go back yes. to the information before? Yeah, what's classified? Yeah. I didn't get the inverted U-shaped. Why is it inverted U-shaped as opposed to like going yeah. off or something? Yeah. Um, so this was, this is, this, I, I was hoping this was you, but it's not, it's not Albert Park, it's a, it's a different park, <laughs> so that you could give us insights into that. But uh, apparently, if memory serves me correctly, this literature says that uh, if there's too stringent, if there's overly stringent um, uh, intellectual property regimes where everything is, is, ex is extremely tight, is extremely um, carefully regulated, there's lots of penalties, um, then uh, IP protection may, it, it may be, uh, uh, foreign companies may be put off from protecting IP because the laws, the courts take too long, the regulations are too intense to, to uh, resolve the cases. And uh, that was what, if I, if I recall correctly, the argument given in that, uh, in that paper. So, um, we, I, we have the, I have the regressions here, I, 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 won't, I won't dwell on them. Uh, the, key, the key explanatory variables that we use are market access, imitative threat, product market competition, and the strength of IPR protection, which align with our hypotheses. So market access is comprised of total sales, imports, and sales, of foreign, sales by foreign firms. Imitative threat refers to triadic patents within, within mentors from China or the focal countries and regions. We, we focus first on China and sub secondarily on, the, on other countries. Product market competition, we used an index which has already been established in the literature, and the strength of IPR protection, another index which has already been established. We had some control variables, uh, WTO dummy, share of inventors, triadic patents only in the China regression, and uh, year dummies, and here are some descriptive statistics. Like I said, I won't dwell on these, and I'll just go straight to the, to the conclusions. So the, so the imitation and product competition are both sectors? Yes. Yes. And uh, here were the hypotheses. Hypothesis one, two, and these were, the, these were the scores that we found for hypothesis four and two. Determinants of uh, of aquatic patenting, international, sorry, international for all countries, and this is what I'd like to focus on is the conclusions and our, our further research. Basically, aquatic patent family as an alternative indicator is a useful way of understanding multinational uh, companies' activities in taking out patents in terms of where they conduct R and D and where they would like to protect their intellectual property beyond uh, triadic patents, which, have, which, as we have shown, have already been increasing to understand the impact of emerging markets on multinational companies' decisions to patent or not to patent. Quadic patent family is a, is a good alternative. And uh, the, ter the determinants in China are the exploitation of potentials of the Chinese market, the threat of imitation by Chinese uh, domestic companies, and domestic competition within China. In the cross-country sample, um, it's similar to the above, and it also includes the strength of the intellectual property regime. Surprisingly, the strength of the intellectual property regime was not considered to be a determinant of taking out a patent in mainland China in addition to the triad of countries, of regions. Is that because there's a perception that it's not as strong, or it's not as relevant? Not, 
I think it's both, not as strong and, and relevant. That it's because it, it's a so huge, it's so deep that finding the people, holding them accountable is, is, is problematic in China. And uh, for future research, we're thinking of conducting firm level analysis in order to link multinationals' market access strategies with their innovation and location strategies. But there, but there must be, if, if in fact the IPR isn't as strong in China, there must still be a deterrent effect that the other three are driving. And I, the, the, the competition, the imitation still views that if there is a patent. Yes, absolutely. And ignore it. Absolutely. The threat of yes. Being, yes. ignoring it means I could get yes. myself in trouble. So there's a deterrent effect. Exactly. Even though and also there's a price uh, influence. The price of taking out patent in China still let, is lower than the price of taking out patents in US, Europe, and, and Japan. So if you've done it all three, just do it to, to cover your bases. Yes, the index. Countries? Yeah. It's in different countries, right? Uh, yes. So where is China and India as it compared to other countries? So this is a fact that would be important. Yeah, no, we didn't. I didn't pluck it out for, for this this presentation. But, but also, I don't see how you can identify whether IPR protection matters for China in the sense that uh, it's, I mean, China's only one observation, right? So it can only be compared to other countries. We were stronger than other countries, right? For this one? No, no, how could you, you said you didn't find that for China, but it's not really a question for China. China's just one, yes, 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 yes. one point, right? Right. So it's China relative to... To other countries. Yeah, so you can only understand that uh, in terms of where China is. Is in relation. Countries, yes. to say, in fact, if you're finding this result in the cross-country result, it does, it's going to matter for China. Right. right? In some sense. Yeah, but these were stronger. These are uh, more important factors than, than the strength of the IPR. So this goes to Anand's uh, presentation as well. I mean, he talked about the, the role of multinationals, and this is one point of confluence, I think, that we can, we can find in, in the report that we do, is the multinational strategy for patenting in, in either India or China. And this is based on uh, data from the automobile industry rather than the pharmaceutical, so I'm not, I'm not a, 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 an expert on, on pharma. And, uh, but we can, as, as the discussion earlier said, we can take out a section within the broader report to focus on pharma. I think that's fine. Anna, did you have any other reactions? Um, well, I think you got to So there are some similarities in yes. terms of findings. So I think. Uh, we should have a conversation of my interview. So, I mean, uh, we can just open up for yeah. reactions. I mean, one, one reaction I have is that uh, both, both presentations at least really focus on kind of multinational yes. strategies, and which, which is obviously interesting and very relevant to EY you know, clients. but. Kind of to me, the most interesting motivating fact was the figure that Anand put up, which showed that from starting from a very similar starting point, you know, China's uh, patenting has gone crazy, and India's has stayed very stagnant. And a lot of the difference is really driven by the domestic firm patenting, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, and yet I don't feel like uh, I have a good idea now about still why. It's so different in China and India. Uh, so I'm just curious if you guys have thoughts about, uh, you know, what explains the difference in, in, in domestic firm patenting activity in China and India. Um, we talked about this a little bit in our phone on phone conversation too. Yeah, yeah. So um, the there are two sort of. Uh, uh, Sort of, sort of answers. None of them, I suspect, are satisfactory. But the first one is, uh, you know, we do have a, a paper, a short piece, which compares these two sort of uh, economies in terms of sectors and so on and so forth. Uh, but you know, it, that is a 
but it has speculations about why these are different. Right? So that would get us into this general discussion of innovation ecosystems, which I think we haven't. We've written it in the, uh, in the one page, but we didn't quite deal with it. Right? So I think it might be useful for us to talk about the fundamental of the innovation ecosystem itself that might partially explain these differences. Uh, um, I think the other issue is uh, the, the rise of oh, sorry, uh, uh, large domestic, China, so mainland Chinese multinationals, ZTE and Huawei, are head and shoulders above of their domestic counterparts, and they do. They're, they're, they're globally ranked. They're at the level of Samsung and Apple and, and in terms of taking that patent, a number of patents. So the rise of these... So you think these are being driven by large? Yes, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And in particular, two. Who, two? Who, yes. Well, well you, can you count for definitely. a large share of this? Yes, because they're in, in the one and third. Lots of patents. Yeah. So it would be interesting. Put that in as well. Well, to, to me, the, and Albert's going to this point, but this slide is going to bring it home in its own site. So you can talk about both of the research projects are on the effectiveness of patents and what people have get at. But the question to me, back to innovation, is if we are in fact seeing an emergence of, let's say, Chinese companies using patents, it's almost like what percentage of the quadic patent, what's the growth in quadic patenting by China firms? Because you, you, you know, in other words, are they saying, you know what, this, so effectively, and I'll overgeneralize, the India firms kind of say, we really question the value of patents. Because they don't kind of work in India, so why would we use them anywhere, right? And you could also say, well, they're not really innovating, they're copying anyway, so why did they bother patenting? Again, of course, over this generalization. Whereas the China companies might be saying, actually, we like this patent regime, and we want to be in a part of not only patenting in China, but we want to make sure we're patented in Europe, the US, and Japan. And so, if you took that rise of the China being aquatic kind of footprint, what are those companies that are making up a big part of that? And does that does that support a premise that China's innovators are getting onto the same playing field in, of other entities and that they're using patent infrastructure globally to protect their IP? Because I would think a ZTE, a Huawei, uh, even uh, you know. Ten cents type type of you know innovation um, that would be interesting to see. Whereas I would suspect that the India MNCs don't really uh, they don't they question the value of patents in their own country. Now maybe we find that outside of India they actually go and patent their stuff. It's just in India they say we're not going to bother. And I think it partially you know this itself is interesting. I think with the conversation. The fact that it's at TE and all these folks, uh, for want of a better word, taking the conventional route, route towards competing with multinationals, but whereas the Indian firms are doing, you know, continuing to do whatever they were doing, right, which is business models outside the patent system, maybe. Right? There's no question about the rise of some Indian multinationals, but it's not because they're, they're innovating in technology, it's because they're Figuring out other ways to compete. Yeah, and you you start it starts to raise questions about the long term. Um, India India's model has always been it survives and grows because it takes advantage of a talent and a cost structure that allows it to compete effectively. The China model seems to be moving from we get that to we're eventually going to run out of the. Right. Cost and they're starting to see that we talked about this in previous meetings, where the cost benefit of low cost labor in China is going away. And what the government's trying to do, and what some of the big emerging China companies are doing, is saying we need to get on board with innovation. Okay. India might be five years away, ten years away, where its cost advantage goes away because its, it's demographics just work to its advantage from a cost perspective. But if we started to see in this analysis a real emergence in China companies going to the quadric patent, they may be saying we're being forced into innovation faster exactly. because we can no longer be the manufacturing hub for the world. We will we'll lose that advantage. We better be engineers, innovators, etc. Um, and then the patents are effectively a 
way in which Christ protected them. So there are two arguments, right? I mean, one is like you're laying out sort of the incentive argument, right? I mean, should I do it or not? There's also the underlying capability argument, which uh, I think we need to do, you know, talk about as well. Which we we said we'll talk about the innovation ecosystem per se. Right? So uh, you know, it, because one argument, of course, like you're saying, is that look, we don't want to do it. We don't think it is important. Uh, and despite you know, again, we, we have to think hard about it. Despite the fact that we might run out of the cost-based advantage type uh, argument. Whereas the Chinese firms have already understood that they are investing in innovation, and, and, not the, and, and the state is supporting them. The state yeah. is giving huge incentives right. for them to do. But that. but is is the query is the premise that if I look at it, both India and China companies are going out and trying to acquire IP yeah. right through acquisitions of other companies. It feels like the Indian companies are going out to acquire the IP to bring it back into their low cost model and say, I'm going to take the Land Rover IP. But I'm going to do it a lot cheaper, right? Whereas the China companies are saying, I'm going to make the acquisition and say, I have to innovate new products with that because my cost is so I, they both have an objective of acquiring IP from elsewhere. But the one is saying, I'm running it through a business model that I have an advantage on, and the Chinese companies are saying, I better run it through an innovation model right. to create the next product in the future that's better and smarter. And for the Chinese, it's a way to leapfrog in the very short period of time, buying the IP so that we can get up, not to dilute it, not to bring it down to our level, but so that we can do right. I want to be the next Google, right. I want to be the next Apple, I want to be the next Tesla. I want to jump to a high-end consumer that isn't as dependent on price, where the India firm is saying, I'm going to exploit the cost model for as long as I can. I don't know. Just See, that's an to... interesting point, because uh, after this uh, Jack thing, if you know, in Tata has launched Tata Zest, and they sell their premium model, say, is the Jaguar White. Uh, so, I mean, you know, exactly like, they bring in that premium color to the country, and they want to sell it like in cheaper models. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't know whether, to what extent these figures, you know, China total patents includes patents that they've acquired through acquisition. Yeah. So since 2000, 2005, the, the uh, 10 five year plan, there's been a big push to go global, to acquire, there's been out, a huge amount of outward FDI with the, with the uh, motivation to acquire yeah. patents, to acquire companies which have intellectual property. Yeah. And if that's included as well, combined with the rise of local domestic MNCs, I'm not surprised by this sort of shooting at it. Buy well, if I buy a firm, I don't. I buy their existing patents, but it doesn't increase right. the China to right. right. unless I take that and I refile it. Right. Yeah. Into China. Into right. China. I mean that. Would... So yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm not sure as to how much. But I, I don't think. think I think it's probably not affecting yeah. the native yeah. yeah. right. But I, I had a question like, again on this figure. Does the private enterprise patents that are not emphasized include multinationals and domestic, or do we know how much of the patenting in China is from multinationals? No, so this paper that I think from... Uh, this, this is lumped them together, I think, Yeah, right? to lump them there's no together. separate foreign yeah. paper. So this is uh, from a different paper, not one. Yeah. So, but that paper but, lumps them together. But for China, have we ever broken that down? The like he did, the, the multinational or foreign patenting versus the domestic? Patent? Yes, there are studies of them. And do you know which is yeah. bigger? Uh, the multinational. It's still more it's multinational, yes, even yes, in China, yes, than domestic. Yes. Yes. Okay, so I was I'll mistaken. Find, yeah. I, first, I I'll find to this as being the domestic. But so yeah, this paper just, uh, makes the case that innovation is sort of more democratized prior, I mean, after the uh, IP law than before. Um, and it's not only increasing, but it's also more diffused uh, in different parts of China. That's one of the dimension to this, because I'm looking at stats on research publications. And China is leading, leading over India, but with the, the gap is much smaller. Like the gap in number of research publications is about four times, which is definitely much smaller than the gap in, in the number of patents. And probably this is, uh, it may suggest that there is a certain barrier in converting research into patentable so technology. Is, again, ongoing work, but we may not, I mean, I may not be able to pull it uh, off before the report is due. But uh, maybe we can add it later on. Because the publication data, like you said, 
uh, at least from Scopus, is very different. And what's interesting is that Indian publications are say, more significant because the, the India has seven uh, average citations per, per, per publication, China has less So my, my less understanding six, is that if you so scale it by the population, the difference goes away. Um, the, the, even the publication, you scale it by the population, you divide it by the population. It, uh, you know, the difference becomes even much smaller. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... But but, by okay. population of researchers or population of population period? Uh, like, so the, there's a uh, database called Scopus, right, which is, counts all publications. So I don't remember the list of publications. No, but, uh, but you, you said, you said divided by population, yeah. you, which population or the population of, of India? Yeah, India was the whole, the whole, the whole, whole population. population. Whole so per capita, if you think about this as per capita publications, then the difference is not that much. But the population are so uh, over, <laughs> over time, so this is data again, right? So, 2007 is when my this data So just going to your point, and I know you're Jay's point, I think the, the ecosystem factor is, is important because the, the, the incentives given by state funding and the state push for our word FTI, and now China's sort of closing the tab saying too much FTI has gone abroad, let's, let's close the tabs, let's stop that. I think that can be underemphasized. Yeah, we should, we should sort of uh, so bring it in. Yeah. We should bring it in like something. Uh, you know, when we maybe the initial chapter is to you know generally give a sense of the ecosystem and distinguish between these ecosystem effects versus the firm incentive effects that Jay is uh, talking about. I think that might be useful. Well, I, mean, I have a question for Jay and maybe Carl if he's still He's awake. I mean, from the standpoint of EY, I, I kind of feel like there's three possible kind of perspectives here on, the, on these issues. One is the multinational perspective, which I'm guessing is going to be of most interest to an EY audience. But the other is really kind of, as suggested by Nan, the government, the policy perspective for governments uh, in terms of trying to trade off these ideas of access. And you know, helping consumers and up with the uh, goal of innovation, a uh, goal of protecting my care. And then the, the third is really kind of the domestic firms, right? And, you know, what, what is, uh, what are the factors that are affecting their ability to make this impact at any rate? Um, do you think it would, I, I kind of feel like maybe it would be better to focus the, especially given the kind of research that from the multinational firm strategies here, but I don't know if you had thought about these three perspectives, or where they should all be in there, or we should it be more the more main interest would be in one, one or the other aspects. So I I think it's the first and the third. I think the the government piece of this and what is the government policy doing is it, you get into too much speculation about its effectiveness and its objectives because it's nationalistic versus not right and it's basically kind of as you know in the, in my view. Um, I think the MNC's you know behavior is clearly saying something, right? Which is he is they're still trying to get patents. They still view the patents, although I did the research would suggest that the, it's a bit more dubious as to whether the value of a patent in India is worth as much. Um, in part because of the way that the, the, the rules are applied. But I think that it's the, to be laid this piece on, I think, the aquatic discussion and I would think an element of saying is India or is, is China and China's domestic companies taking a different approach to the value of patents and what they're doing to try to create. It would be an interesting overlay to say, well, MNCs are still trying to secure patents. They're clearly coming in and looking at that fourth exactly. country. They're clearly looking at China as a place that's of value. But interestingly, China companies are also in that same game, right? They, they too have started to say the value of patents are important. And if you look then at the types of companies underneath who are going up and securing them, they would be viewed, I suspect, as the ones that are viewed as much more innovative today, you know, we probably move more tech sector. But it's only a matter of time before 
and whether it's the ChemChina buying Syngenta and getting into Ag Chem or whether it's Kafka, you know, picking up Cardinal Noble or something, you know, that those guys are going to go to the next level, right? The SOEs are probably a little slow, but will they also be looking to access patentable processes and then use that to drive innovation? I think that would be of interest because we clearly would like to also be able to talk to our domestic market client base and particularly as you see you know, both India and China companies in particular as they go global, right? They go global but they go probably with different objectives, right? And, um, I, you know, and, and I think that that would help highlight that why the emerging markets matter and why the domestic players and what they're doing still matters because they're clearly, this is part of that trend uh, and in particular, the China government seems to be pushing its SOEs to do more of that. The Indian government, you know, isn't really pushing that per se um, as a matter of policy. But the one belt, one road, you know, trying to really push that kind of modernization of the state-owned enterprises it would be an interesting, an interesting tool. I, mean, I, would add, I would, I would, I would, you know, I'd almost make it equal because I think the impact that EMS is going to have on markets is as much domestic market application as it is, as it is international or MNC. MNC is important, but it's even becoming countries are becoming almost more important than, than MNCs from a strategic point of view. And whatever the, as Jason, whatever is going to happen in the domestic market is going to be impacted with what's happening multinational. We're, we're, we're just, we're more integrated. We're, we're all, we're all become multinational, even if we're only a domestic market. Because our behavior is going to be, you know, driven by, shaped by international issues. Regulatory, trade, etc. Now, I do think there's a possibility for policy issues, but it's very specific. I mean, if you just listen today, the conversation between Russia and in India, you know, on different issues. There are times where comparative detailed analysis does have a positive impact on government policy, but not a general, you know, subjective conversation. It's something very specific. Because governments will change if driven to very specific issues. So I had that question for the, for the scope of guys. I mean, is there any sense about what what are the what's the state of these issues in, in Russia? Or I mean, you don't have to know anything. Farm is a big issue. Is there a lot of patenting going on? Or is it, well, um, is there, is there? I'd say that uh, intellectual property is not a very high-profile issue in Russia, and basically, it's it's considered to be more or less protected. That's not to say that there are not debates. Uh, and there are definitely issues, but there were more issues with trademarks than with patents. We did have that transition from the Soviet era, when it's more or less like China in the Soviet times, uh, everything belonged to state, and so then it, it was turned into some type of modern patent legislation. Uh, we don't, as I said, we don't have patents on software, we do. I, I'm not quite sure what's the state with uh, patenting of, of these uh, substances and molecules and what, what, there are certain peculiarities to this, I guess, but I'm not much of an expert. Uh, but overall, it's, it's not considered to be that big of an issue. Uh, I'd love to see what's, what's the number of patents uh, in Russia, but I guess it's not very big. Uh, we do have different industry structure, so it's more probably about uh, machinery and these type of things. Definitely we do have a lot in everything military related, we do have massive military industry. Um, so, that's the brief feeling. I, I, I've never researched the issue I've been into a couple of uh, situations when I was in business, I, think I, I was just investigating some particular cases where they took anything from the problem. So, I can say, but it's, it's really, it would be really very interesting to, to 
rational than my psychology. What question I had for both uh, Anand and Amar is the, 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 the data on patenting seems kind of dated. Like all your data you're using is 2006. Is, is there a reason why we're not using more recent data? Is, this, is it expensive or is it available or can we update it? So it is expensive. The pharma, the domestic stuff, domestic slash pharma in my case, is expensive for data to 2009. Uh, this, uh, you know, the cross country, partly because these studies have already been done, so you know, uh, it's unclear as to whether we can collect data and run any of these restrictions. So, uh, but certain parts, yes, like this one, the reason, this particular slide, the reason why we stopped in 2006 is I could not find updated data on China. So, I, you know, just for comparison purposes, I stopped in 2006. But the India, India data can, you know, I, we have to do 1,000 times. So. The, the total patent data? Yeah. 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 This is a basic so, descriptive? Yeah. So, I, I have, some of it can be updated, some of it not, but if you're talking about updating them, Updating them until 2015 might be a bit hard, uh, but we could try uh, in 2010 or that. So then it's just, a, I'm trying to understand, so I mean, really I mean, it's, it's, a it's, a huh? it's just costly? You know? Well, uh, in terms of false, you know, aggregate statistics is, you know, can be updated, I think. Uh, but things which uh, are coming from some empirical analysis or regressions, they would you know, it would be hard to collect the data and rerun the regressions and see whether the same conclusions hold or not. Uh, so that would be a bit of a rush if the report is expected in March. So, but, uh, but these kind of aggregate statistics, I think it's probably uh, a lot easier. And, and the data, you're getting global data on patterns. And that you can get all the way up? I think we can get up to 2014 now. Yeah. And is that expensive? Uh, it's not. Really not too bad. Yeah, not too bad. It costs, but it's not. Okay. But you're linking it to firm data? Is that what makes it more costly? Yeah. Because yours is just looking at the patent data yes. itself, I guess. Just looked up. Russia is more or less on par with India in terms of patent applications. In 2014, and it was higher than India in patent granted. Uh, and another dimension which can be interesting is the rate of patent applications to granted patents. As, as far as I can see, it varies quite a lot by country. Uh, there is a big difference in China and Russia, for example. So probably it also influences the, somehow the ecosystem, the chances of getting the patent actually, they motivate or demotivate companies to apply for patent. Well, I also think that from the ecosystem perspective, we could add something because I guess that we've got uh, since recently some changes in the way how government supports innovation in in, in Russia. Because well, I, I would say that we hadn't had much uh, industry priorities uh, late, earlier, on, but since recently there are some. And uh, we see how government starts supporting industries in specific sectors in, in, uh, in terms of innovation and uh, um, access to the market. Uh, so I think we could uh, uh, um, well, talk a little bit about um, policy implications and things like that. I'm not sure if whether it's uh, a good example or a bad example, but in any way it it's, it's some, some, something to compare. Um, it's, it's, I, I mean, it's going beyond uh, patents and uh, touching upon the, the, the broader um, innovation ecosystem, which is probably something that uh, has uh, evolved in, in Russia since uh, recently. And I think we could, uh, we could work on that. And uh, obviously, pharma is one of the very very good examples uh, for Russia. Uh, as Vladimir has already mentioned, that would 
add up on what we have just heard about India and uh, China. IT sector would also be an interesting example because, uh, as you know, we've got a couple of very interesting uh, large companies competing against uh, Google and others locally and in, in some other markets and government. Uh, I'm not talking about Russian hackers who are involved in uh, but anyway, it's it, it's it, it's one of the sectors where where uh, we've got uh, something to say in terms of the way how government supports it and, and how the sector gets uh, to innovation. And uh, um, another perspective, automobiles. Uh, it was a little bit different from from that perspective. So we could probably provide another example. Because it's it's uh, probably the failed one. So how it, it it didn't work actually? Because there was an idea to bring um, Western and Asian uh, technologies localized, uh, and it worked in an industrial in terms of the industrialization because a lot of um, assembly plants and uh, supply chains were localized, but. Uh, it had, uh, hasn't happened in terms of the innovation. So maybe it could also add to some uh, investor perspective on that. But, but well, anyway, I think we will be happy to participate in this uh, uh, research, probably not lead, but contribute uh, certain uh, perspectives on, 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 on Russia and Russian companies going elsewhere. Do you think case studies would be? Good idea to uh, include into the research, not just general, uh, but some sort of. Uh, 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 in terms of the firm level, maybe we could uh, think about certain case studies like Pata we discussed here or uh, others, because here we could definitely work on some Russian cases where uh, on a company level as well. That would be. Uh, I think that's part of the idea. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, um, yeah. yeah. no, to the extent that. Uh, would be it would yield fruitful insights for the my clients or case studies be yeah I mean you know to me the, the issue and the question on that is always will the client be comfortable with the uh, details of their cases being publicly talked about so if you talk about a model here is the T E their strategy and what they're doing the patents and all that and then he gets excited about having that but, you know, I understand what they ask, I don't want that to be. If it's public record stuff, yeah, that's mm -hmm. probably okay. Yeah, it's, it's not that's like some yeah, interview, you know. Yeah, yeah. And positive. Yeah, yeah. ISP, we have like a case center we, we get like a sign off from any organization. Yeah, and if they're not comfortable, they ask us to use like a disguised name. So we have this collaboration with them. Yeah, but here uh, I think we are talking more about case examples to illustrate the points right. rather than uh, to, to do a study to get insights. Right. 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 Uh, right. Because th that takes time to do a case study to get insights and uh, then uh, it has to be generalize it. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems like uh, just hearing that you know Russia is similar to India, it seems like China is kind of exceptional. At the emerging market level, the comparisons looking at the countries in the quad, 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 quad seem to be more advanced countries like Korea. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, are there any other emerging markets with high levels of quad patenting or any kind of China is a standard. That's China. Yeah, so I think it has to be interesting because Russia has a good um, basic science. This thing. Yeah, and it's like this. Yeah, a lot, of it came, a lot of China's came from Russia. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> a lot of China's really quasi came from Russia. Right? I mean, social, during the social. Uh, but, but once again, the, I think the goal, as I understand, is to deliver this by March or April. So, well, so I some, think. Time, some time frames. Uh, a lot of these questions also much better than time frames. Right. Well, I think we can trade off time for quality. I mean, if this makes sense. Right. I mean, it's not. There's no thick. There's no. 
it's, it's still a deadline, but obviously we have an interest in the system right. in a timely way. But if, if, if an extra month or two is going to really improve what we can do, then of course we will accept it. Are there any sort of templates or exemplary sort of um, reports, not necessarily over innovation, but just in terms of style, uh, depth, uh, length, that we can, we can refer to would be helpful to use those as guideposts? Well, I, not to not to the content, like I say, but if, yeah. if, if there are any of the content as well, that'd be welcome. To. So the way I would describe it is that the reports you produce and the reports all the EADS uh, uh, researchers have produced tend to be driven by them and their universities, their faculty, in terms of the basic approach. What EY then does is tries to leverage excerpts and extracts out of it into more of our thought leadership. We don't produce, you know, like we don't share detailed academic reports. Uh, we'll link it to the thought leadership that we'll put out. This, to me, would be something where we talk about uh, something around innovation, fostering culture of innovation, and how, you know, the emerging markets are, you know, embracing innovation with a different, a different approach, a different theory, whatever you want to call it, and then reference the information that says, you know, so jump to conclusions, but you know. China appears to be kind of embracing the, the value of patents, innovation, et cetera. And companies would suggest that they're innovating in a Western way. India is using innovation and technology in a slightly different format. Da, 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 da. Russia's got, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and so you, you build it more into a release on innovation, but you wouldn't get into a lot of the details, but you might take some of these excerpts. You know, because our our research and the stuff that we will do from a thought leadership perspective seems to be we write it for a much more kind of non-academic audience to consume in a different type of fashion. And so methodology process is a lot of the stuff that you guys will scrutinize and look at in an academic paper. Most of our readers would be as interested in it. But for the report that we produce, um, how detailed should we be on the regressions and the methodology? Should they be? The background, or should they be given equal? Equal. Uh, um, I think you should write it based on the academic, okay. your academic audience, which would probably want more of that detail in there. Okay. And then what we'll tend to do is we tend to filter some of that stuff out. Okay. Um, and then again, reference your content as, as, as opposed to. Well, wait a second. I'm now getting confused. I think their our goal has been to actually write. There could be an academic product, but I think their idea was to help draft something that was really targeted, distilled with the main, which I think should not have the methodology. And regression, so. I mean, in, in a report what? for EY, working with EY, but if your goal is to do something that's a little bit more co-branded and it's targeted to the EY audience, then I think that's the kind of model that Anand was thinking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's great. Well, it, it makes it easier for us, right? right. So we have to work less at, at translating it and interpreting it. Yeah. Um, so you know, I just don't want to undermine the academic no, no, no. research credibility of it. But clearly, that executive summary of the work that we do and co-branding that, uh, which we've done some some of the stuff that you know Skolkova has produced, has effectively been written in that context. Right. So my, my thought was more to reference the academic papers. Yes. But to write it in a uh, format that you are suggesting. Right. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's the manager yeah. on the airplane who wants to read the yeah. report yeah. on a two hour flight. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah exactly. So He's going to have distractions and going to be served coffee and tea during that. Yeah. It isn't going to lose their place as exactly. opposed to they're into the, you know, the, the regression yeah. coefficient trying to understand what yeah. so, yeah. yes. But I mean, if you write it in that context, then it's a lot easier for us to... So th that, was, that was the plan. Yeah. 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 Good. I think the initial goal is to shoot for something co-branded. Yeah. If in the product it turns out it doesn't seem exactly suitable, then it could be something that EY can extract or right. whatever. But I think it, as a target, that's yeah. where we would just try to do something as a almost a finished product for EY. Exactly. But obviously with EY, that would be, that would be fine. Yeah, yeah. No, that would be great. That would be good, right? Yeah. Yeah. Universities want us to do that as well, to write things that uh, managers can do. The average person, yeah. 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 So with, with that in mind, are there any um, examples or just regular reports that have well, I think, I think Ilsa shared some, right? Okay. Those ones. There's some reports. 
okay. that are, I mean, we, we've, if, if we've seen some of the UI way. reports on it. Okay. I mean, they tend to be, you know, 10 to 12 pages, yeah. something like that. But I don't know, the, the Skokobo one that you've just finished is how long, or is it different? Oh, the different oh, picture? Yeah. That's, well, that's quite long, pages. right? I mean, the, it's like, yeah, it's but, uh, it's, it's a bigger one. Uh, uh, yeah, so that seems unusual for EY. Uh, it seems un different it, than a lot of the EY. It's, yeah, it's, it's different, but uh, uh, usually. It's a smaller one on the measure markets, but also it's about 50 pages. And we have uh, analytical parts, which are smaller, well, they're quite thin. And uh, we have. Uh, 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 you know, this, uh, Appendices that that, that that can uh, comprise a, a major part of the whole thing. So uh, actually, I mean, but this is kind of an unusual report. In my, I haven't seen an EY report that long. No, that no, 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 no. Well, we do uh, yeah. we do a couple. We do a mega trend report out Just there. Right. Yeah, which is pretty voluminous. And we used to we discontinued it. We used to do a uh, uh, a globalization index uh, before downloads. But it got lost in the clutter of one now, so it is continued. But uh, yeah, some of it will be uh, you know, more brief. We used to do a really huge one in the farm. I mean, I don't know if they do it anymore, but farm 2.0 it was extremely extensive. But it was a lot more work, probably, than two hours. Okay. So there's more of a preference to the shorter. Yeah, I mean, that's today's consumer, right? It's, it's digital, it's interactive. Okay, so maybe we can think about that. So this is the longest, long version model. So I think that probably is. is uh, was this one for me? Was this one for me? Look, look, just yeah. see it. That's not, that's not. Um, okay, great. So we're at the...